fellows in the Mega Complexity Program, um, starting with Li Ji Chen, who will tell us about new forms of hardness for science. Yeah. Uh, hi, I'm a fellow of the Meta Complexity Program at our petition. So then I'm going to talk about my recent works on new forms of hardness versus randomness. Can you hear me, by the way? Good. Okay. So first, uh, I, was, I guess everyone knows what's randomized algorithms. So they are algorithms that make coin choices during computation. And they are only expected to be correct with high probability. And uh, essentially, they are everywhere in computer science and they're very useful, have thousands of applications. That's even, uh, there are many books about them. This is one of them. So de-randomization is the, is the process, as, as the name suggests, is the process that converts randomized algorithms into equivalent deterministic algorithms. And in the notation of complexity theory, it's essentially asking whether BPP the class of all problems solvable in probabilistic polynomial time equals p, the problem solvable in deterministic polynomial time. And I think this is one of the central questions in complexity theory and has been studied um, since many years ago. And uh, very interestingly, a central thing in complexity theory is actually about the connection between randomization and hardness. By hardness, I mean various lower bounds, like circuit lower bounds or some other lower bounds, like uniform lower bounds. So that tight interplay between these two notions. For example, a classical lab work shows that if you assume sufficiently strong circuit lower bounds, you will get polynomial time randomization. And the, for, for the other direction, that another very important lab work shows that for non-trivial randomization, you can actually get circuit lower bounds. And uh, Williams even used this to prove some unconventional lower bounds against x zero. But today I'm going to focus on the first connection. So I want to take a deeper look on what the classical work did. So essentially they show that assuming strong enough circuit level bound, you can get polynomial time randomization. And uh, my, most of my work on this direction are, follow, are motivated by two very fundamental questions regarding the result for this classical works. So if you look carefully, what is the consequence? It's polynomial time randomization. And the more precisely, it says that all T of n time randomized algorithms can be converted into um, T of n to the state time deterministic algorithm for some big constant C. Like it's, it's not specified, but it's greater than, let's say, eight. So this type of randomization is perfectly suitable for answering the question of P equals BPP, but it's not enough for any practical application because it's still too slow. So the, the very natural question is how can we get better? What's the, what's the right answer for the limit of generalization? Can we get no overhead at all? Or you will, we have to pay something. What's the minimum overhead? So that's the first question I was very interested about is how fast can generalization possibly be? It's also very similar to the recent, recent lab work on fine grained complex, complexity where you care about the actual polynomial. And uh, now if you look at the second part, the first, the, the assumption part of the classical works, people have assumed circuit lower bounds, very strong one, like uh, E is not in the exponential style circuits. And uh, from this assumption, they can show that oh, it's actually equivalent to PRGs, so the random generators with log and seed, which are enough for randomization. But unfortunately, it's notoriously hard to prove any circuit, to prove circuit lower bound against unrestricted circuits. And currently, the best one is, is 3.1 times n instead of full exponential. So another question is that whether circuit lower bounds are actually necessary for generalization. And maybe those assumptions are just too strong. So the, the, the second question I'm very interested in in this introduction is to understand what is the minimum assumption needed for generalization. 
So just, just, just like in crypto, although we know we need to make some assumption, we want to, we want to make minimal assumption. So the same goes for generalization. So let me first start with the, my last work on the first topic, how fast can generation possibly be? When you line up work with Roy Tao, so he will also be speaking up. He will also be speaking about similar objects, similar subjects in the, in the next talk, I think. And we start the, we saw that under possible harness assumptions, we essentially determine the best possible worst case generalization. By worst case, I mean the generation should work on every input for randomized algorithms and a constant run as a morning protocols. And unfortunately, there will be some overhead, which cannot be avoided assuming some other harness assumptions from fine grain complexity. So, to further reduce the overhead, we also show that under strong, very strong harness assumptions, we can actually achieve effective generalization of randomized algorithms and a constant run as the morning protocols with no overhead. I'll say a little bit more about what's effective generalization. So more precisely, Classical line of work show that under circuit level bounds, you can get generalization with the big polynomial overhead. And a recent breakthrough by Doron, Moskowitz, Owen, and Zuckerman show that under lower bounds against non uniform money asset protocols, you can get quadratic generalization. And my recent work with, with Roy shows that assuming one function exists and the lower bounds against non uniform algorithms, which is very similar to circuit level bounds, you can actually get generalization with an overhead of only n. Surprisingly, we also show that following our work by Williams under an assumption called sharp n s e t h, this this overhead of n is actually tight. So this is essentially a barrier for faster generalization. And uh, similarly, we can we also look at the generalization of as the merging proof systems where you want to randomize into n p, and the. Uh, the same story goes, the classical work show you can get big polynomial generalization. And um, my recent work with Roy shows that under strong, under similar lower bound assumptions, you can actually, similar to the stronger lower bound assumptions, you can actually get an overhead of n. And also you, if the number of runs goes to, it's a constant. We, can, we also classify what's the overhead with respect to the number of runs. Again, under sharp n sets, all results are tight. So the sharp NSS is also a, is still a barrier for faster generalization in, in, the, in the randomized proof system case. How do we circumvent this sharp NSS barrier? One lesson from crypto is that if two things are indistinguishable by polynomial time algorithms, then we can pr practically say they are the same thing. So inspired by this notion, can we actually show randomness is indistinguishable from useless? By which I mean that <laughs> by, by this, we mean that for every Kelvin time randomized algorithm, you want to find an algorithm with slightly more running time deterministic algorithm such that for every polynomial time sampleable distribution, the, your algorithm is actually, it's very hard to find a mistake. So it's correct under every polynomial time sampleable distribution except for negligible probability. So, so in other words, no efficient adversary can break your deterministic algorithm by finding a mistake, meaning that it's going to be very, very useful in the practice. So it's essentially solve the problem in the practice. So essentially you want to do a fine grain version of this question that sort of has been asked before. Yeah. Yeah. And it's very important because uh, if you can get with no overhead, then it's going to be very useful. And uh, in, in terms of notation, I'll just write BP times of N is the effective time of N with some with n to the one overhead. So um, under some complicated but still possible assumption, I'm not going to define specify it here. Uh, it's, a, it's a somewhat complicated but a very possible hardness assumption. For example, you can take f to be some concrete hash function. It's very likely to be true. You can get this uh, effective generalization with very small overhead. The epsilon here can be taken into any constant. And uh, we also achieved the same thing for. So, sorry, what about this F? So it's shrinking. Yeah, it's shrinking. And uh, what else about this too about it? Oh, so it's. Uh, I mean, it gives you a lot of shrinking functions, but you want. Oh. Okay, that's some complicated notion on it. So essentially, it's saying, like, saying that for each output, 
for each output bit, you can compute the integer of n time. But it's very hard to compute the f as a whole uh, in like less than t of n times n to the epsilon time. So it's like hard to approximate. So it's like a non batch computable function. Yeah. We, we also achieved the same thing for the Arsene Morning protocol under even stronger assumptions. But uh, I think Roy will talk about it. So I, I, I'll just go away. So one thing I want to say is that uh, in terms of techniques, that you can actually show that no PRGs or black body animation can give you effective animation even with a sublinear overhead, let's say n to the 0 0.99. So you really need to use something beyond PRG, and we call it non black box randomization. And uh, so what we are essentially using is some, something called targeted PRG, but I don't have time to define it now. So uh, how much time do I have? Give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So oh, how many minutes? One or two minutes. Okay. So previous demonstration frameworks are based on PRGs. Oh, so now I'm going to move to the second question, which is the minimum assumption needed for generalization. And uh, we know that previous generalization frameworks are based on PRGs, and uh, they imply generalization. And uh, another line of work, but uh, it's unclear whether generalization requires circuit lower bounds. Another line of work shows that if you assume uniform lower bounds, like x not equal to BPP, you can get PRG that is equivalent to PRG that, that works on average, from which you can get average generalization, but it's unclear whether, and also it's implied by P equals BBP, but it's very unclear whether you can get P equals BBP by only an average case PRG, because they are too weak. So maybe the assumptions for, for the, this type of assumption are just too weak. So as you can see, something is missing here, and that's exactly what we are trying to um, fill in. So yeah. So in, our, so in our recent paper with Roy, we actually introduced a new type of harness assumption, which is which has two-way connection between generalization. So it sits right in the middle. So it's not it's neither too strong nor too weak. So what is the assumption? Uh, yeah, I, I, should, I should have time to. So it says that there yeah, exists a polynomial time function from n bit to n bit that is almost all input hard against all n to a 10 time randomized algorithms. So what do I mean by almost all input hard? It means that for all but finitely many input inputs x, and for every n to a 10 time randomized algorithm, a is not going to be able to compute f. So it's an extremely strong assumption saying that every non-uniform algorithm must fail on almost all inputs computing f. But, uh, but uh, so why do we care about this assumption? It's, very, it's actually very simple to prove that if P equals BPP, then this assumption is true. So it's a highness assumption that is implied by P equals BPP. And the proof is very, very simple, just a simple diagonalization, like, like two lines. And, we are, and of course, this is only one way, one way connection. It, it, it may not be that interesting. But we, but we also show that with an additional uh, constraint put on the function f, if you further assume f is computable by polynomial size, log space, uniform circuits of n squared depths, you can actually you can actually get p equals bbp. So so if you if you add uh, some more constraints, then you can actually show almost all input harness is also sufficient for generalization. So putting everything together, we actually have two way we have two two way connections between between almost all input harness and uh, also p equals bbp. So in some sense, it's uh, both sufficient and necessary for generalization. And Roy will speak more about some other type of connection between generalization and the uh, harness. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll just stop here. There are, some, there are many new ideas, but I don't have time to go through this. So, yeah, thanks. Maybe we can have a quick question while Roy sets up. So there's a slight gap between the two assumptions, right? There's assumption low depth and assumption. Yeah, so it's yeah. not the same thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's that's some. Yeah, I think I think you can fix the gap with the with your um. So I think this is a very interesting question. Yeah. Okay, so next, uh, Roy Tell will continue the theme of de-randomization. He'll tell us about the role of de-randomization in TCS.